Welcome to Money Talks, a series of interviews with me, Liam Halligan, Economics and Business Editor of GB News. In this episode, I talk to Mark Fain, co-founder of Crocus, a horticultural company based in Sunningdale, Berkshire, that grows flowers and plants, which it then sells for the most part online. Crocus, like so many businesses, initially viewed both Brexit and then this COVID pandemic as potentially disastrous. What's happened though is over the last few years, Crocus has thrived, quadrupling its capacity to fulfil orders, taking on more and more staff. Tell us about Crocus. When did you start out? How big is the business now? Well, we started in 2000. Um, I wrote a business plan, which was two pages of A4. <laughs> um, and I sent it around to a few people. Uh, and I was amazed because in those days, the internet was this great, exciting new thing that no one really quite understood. We raised quite a lot of money on the back of it. And uh, we, we started off really without, I, I have got a background in horticulture. I knew a lot about plants, but I knew very little about on the technology side. And we uh, launched it on April Fool's Day, 2000. We sat there having flicked the switch, waiting for the first order to arrive. And um, I think that was my mother about sort of three o'clock in the afternoon placing the first order. But it was just one of these great anticlimax moments. And now we are processing up to four, on a busy day, four to 5,000 orders a day, turning over about 30 million, uh, employing 300 people. So it's, it's been quite a journey and it's an exciting one. That's a pretty big business. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it is exciting. What's very satisfying for me is the fact that um, the horticulture is, I think it's viewed as quite a menial industry, but there's some really interesting talent there. And the more we build, the more uh, people we employ. We, we are launching an apprenticeship scheme in December this year, trying to bring back uh, young talent into the industry. And I think that's, uh, that's the way to go because labor is going to be a real challenge for us over the next few years. Now, in the last few years, your business has been t through two really big shocks, big changes. Uh, Brexit and COVID. Let's talk a little bit about Brexit, first of all, because as I understand it, the vast majority of your flower growing was going on on the continent rather than here in the UK. So as Brexit approached, as Brexit happened since, how has it changed your business? Well, dramatically is the answer. And, and I am um, kicking myself because I didn't think that the Brexit vote would go the way it was going to go. So my planning, uh, looking back on it, we did very little planning. Um, but the reality is that we were importing about 70% of our plants from France, Holland, Belgium. Uh, and that's a very efficient system, worked extremely well. Uh, and then suddenly overnight, uh, the exchange rate went from 140 uh, to the euro down to about 110. So we had a 25% increase in our cost base. And we sat around the table saying, crikey, we've got to do something about this really quite dramatically. And, it, and it, although it has really made uh, the administrative life a lot more difficult, importing from Europe is much more difficult. What it did do is it forced us to invest on our own propagation unit. So we are now growing, this year we'll grow about 600,000 plants uh, in our own prop unit. That's going to grow to about a million over the next... That's in Sunningdale in Berkshire, right? That's right. And, and, and what share of your total sales, Mark, sorry, is 600,000 plants? Well, that's going to be about um, 30, 25 to 30% this year. Quite a year. chunk. Yeah. Quite a chunk. And we've really been trying hard to bite into that 70%. That's now below 50. And our objective is to get it to about 35% over the next few years. So you, imports will be only 35%. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And that's important for us also, not only because it gives us security of supply, but increasingly, and you might have read some of the, the pests and diseases that have been coming in from Europe, it, this means we have much greater control over that side of the business. So Brexit took you aback. Uh, you didn't expect it to happen, but the business has been modified since then. Did, I mean, it must have been a really quite difficult set of decisions to make. You must have been in shock, wondering if the business could survive. It was a survival moment for us because we, looking back on it, we had 25 consecutive months of reduced gross margins uh, purely because of that exchange rate. So your profits being nibbled away, nibbled away, Literally nibbled away. Every month. And that, that gets at you yeah. after a bit. You know, it, it messes with your head. Big time. <laughs> <laughs> it <messes with> your <laughs> head. And, and, and I had to, my partner and I had to put a, some more money into the business. We still had a strong belief in the business. Yeah. The internet was still quite at an early stage in horticulture. Not that many people were, were buying stuff online. But so the, the fundamental argue, business argument was still strong. But if you see every month that margin 
being cut, being cut, being cut. And we were reluctant to pass that on to the consumer. Um, and it's taken us best part of three years to respond in terms of changing the product mix, changing our supply chain. And one of the uh, unexpected consequences of Brexit for us is that we have, we have gone out very actively sourced from UK nurseries. Right. Because it was so easy historically to source from Europe. But now we've said, come on, we've really got to try and get security of supply from UK nurseries. So the two things of more UK nurseries, growing more ourselves, uh, has really changed that dramatically. But a considerable share still of the flowers you buy are imported. What are the realities, Mark, at the moment of importing a fragile, uh, perishable, um, precious, uh, high value uh, product like fresh flowers? The, uh, the reality is that the paperwork is immense. And uh, DEFRA, who are in charge of that side of things, have, the government taken, department, yeah, yeah. have taken a while to, to uh, tell us what that system should be. Um, it's, we, we, we're fortunate in the sense that we, uh, the, the, the customs uh, system has allowed, they realize it's perishable. They can't be sitting in the port for six weeks. They'll be all dead. Um, so we, we benefited from that to a certain extent. Mm. But it has unquestionably made more, uh, life more difficult. We have two more people in the office just processing paperwork because of those imports. Um, so it is not easy. And if the invoice doesn't marry up with a shipping note, which doesn't marry up with all the other stuff, um, it makes life extremely difficult. And we've had hard goods of bringing in from, um, from the Far East, sitting in the, in the port for four to five to six weeks. So non-perishable goods. Non-perishable yeah. goods, really suffering from that. So yeah. it, but one of the things that I've, uh, I have found is that during this process where you do hit these big roadblocks, you're forced to think up creative solutions. And I think generally as an industry, we're, uh, but as a country generally, I think we're quite creative in terms of coming up with a plan B. Now you obviously have long-standing relationships with the flower growers who you deal with in Germany, France, Spain, Italy, and all the rest of it. Um, but aside from, from, from them trying to get their product to you so yeah. they can get paid, do you think there's been some deliberate game playing going on by the authorities on, on either side? Do you think there's some foot dragging on making the administration work? Uh, there's definitely been some foot dragging. Mm. Um, I, uh, game playing, I'm, I'm not so, it's difficult to say. I think that um, we have found it very frustrating getting clear instructions from the various government organizations. When Our government can, and overseas governments, oh yeah, both. No, definitely. Um, and, and Europe want, certainly this is my interpretation, are keen to persuade people that leaving the European Union is not a good thing and therefore yeah. they should, we should be seen to be suffering. I was a, a staunch Remainer, but um, I realized that there are some big political things going on there. Unquestionably, as, a, as, a, uh, um, as an importer, we have found it uh, significantly more difficult. And just parking COVID for now, we'll come to that. Let's spool back to 2018, 2019, early 2020, when thankfully none of us had ever heard of COVID. <laughs> um, how was the business going post-Brexit? Well, we took a big hit uh, straight after Brexit for yeah. the first year. We lost a lot of money, yeah. uh, and it, purely because of that exchange rate loss. You know, if you can, yeah. you imagine if 70% of your imports are suddenly 25% more expensive, yeah. that hits the bottom line. Since then, we've had growth over the last 12 years of 15% compound every year. That's a big number. But the last, <laughs> it is a big number. The last three years have been 30%. So it, it has unquestionably accelerated. COVID has been the main reason more recently for uh, that strong growth. But even historically, it's been, uh, it's been very strong for us. Right. This is, this is particularly interesting, what you just said there. COVID has been the main reason yeah. for this strong growth. So I describe COVID as a shock to your business. And of course, you know, COVID's a terrible thing. And many people have unfortunately died from this yeah. ghastly virus. But tell us about the impact then of the COVID pandemic on, on your business. What did you think? back on the, was it the 23rd of March? Yeah, I think Boris really Johnson are. said, we all need you to stay at home. <laughs> what were you thinking, Mark? I went into, I thought, oh God, we just come out of, we've just sorted Brexit. <laughs> like, please don't give us another sort of, sort of steam train sort of hitting at us, hitting us. Um, I, I was, uh, for me, this was a, a, a real um, business threatening moment. Yeah because none of us knew. You yeah. couldn't ring the, someone up, a helpline, and say, yeah. what do we do, how do we? So um, you go back into that very intense, uh, creative process, 
where the core three or four people in the business, we would meet every day at four o'clock. We would just talk everything through. And every day we'd talk about something we never expected to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things that <clears throat> generally was very positive for us and did surprise us, if you look at the, the horticultural industry, 15% um, is online. This is pre-COVID. 15% yeah. is online, 85% of the gardens. Was that your business or industry? The industry, generally. And your business was like the rest of the industry? No, we were, we were sort of near uh, 80, 90% online. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, we were in that little pocket of 15%, yeah. but the government basically closed down all the sheds, all the garden centers. That 85% was just off, off limits. Yeah. So overnight, literally overnight, 100% of that demand focused on the 15% of supply. The online supply. Yeah and those masks don't work. Yeah. Uh, very, very quickly we saw this. But you were geared up for that because you were an online specialist. Yeah, but you're not, ex we're, we're geared up for 15% growth a year. Yeah. We're not geared up so for- So suddenly your logistics, your online operation, your packing, your mailing, I mean, that's stretched wire thin, right? Uh, absolutely. At the same time as we are thinking, the 100 people in the warehouse, they can't stand that close to each other. Yeah. So we had to convert another building uh, oh, into a, a warehouse. So, you're so, so at the same time, you've got this enormous stretch and in, uh, increase in demand. You're thinking, how on earth do we make that, um, the, the logistics work? Um, and, but we were seeing three, four, five hundred percent increase in, in, in demand. That was not because people were buying more flowers overall is because they were buying a lot more flowers online yeah, exactly. because physical outlets had been closed down. Exactly. Absolutely right. And families apart, they want to send each other flowers. Yeah. You can't go around for someone's birthday, you send them some flowers, don't you? Well, it's flowers or plants, I mean, yeah. and, and, um, or trees or whatever it might be. And, and bear in mind that suddenly everyone's sitting at home, they're thinking, okay, well, I've got to do some work, uh, but also, actually that, that bathroom's looking a bit ropey, yeah. or that kitchen's looking a bit ropey, or I'm gonna spend some time in the garden. And yeah. that's really what happened very strongly. We saw a significant increase in a, a younger generation getting into gardening. Yeah. Uh, the RHS think there are three million more gardeners now because of COVID. We very quickly worked out we could not supply that demand, that we couldn't cope with that 400% increase. And we actually said, look, we can only process, let's say a thousand orders a day. Um, uh, which was absolutely the maximum we could achieve given the supply chain, given the, the warehouse logistics. And we were getting there by about 9, 30, 10 o'clock each morning. And we just had to say, look, we can't take any more orders that day. Um, uh, which, was, which was a real anathema to me, because I mean, yeah. you're there trying oh, to want to take it. Business, yeah, business, exactly. business. Cash leave your money on the table. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, I kind of go, oh, oh, how, do we, how do we solve that problem? Um, but it was, it was the right thing to do because mm. a number of, of companies kept taking the, the, the money, take, taking the orders, and that was a real car crash, mm. you know, because the customers get fed, really get fed up. Yeah, the service up. goes down, quality goes down, orders aren't fulfilled. Yeah. Exactly, so, and, and we've just spent the last um, 18 months really since then ramping up that, um, the, that capacity and now we're able to do about 4,000 orders a day. Yeah. Um, so, which, which, is, which is great, but it, it took a long, long time to do and that. And what was your pre-COVID capacity in terms of orders per day? Uh, about 1,000. So you've quadrupled, quadrupled yeah. your yeah. capacity. Yeah, we've moved to a seven-day operation, a seven-day week operation. We've, we've lengthened the, the hours. We've become a lot more efficient in the way we pick and pack. And, but it's like so often is that if you're put under serious pressure, yeah. you have to come up with a solution. Fight or flight, isn't it? It mm -hmm. is, yeah. absolutely. And you can't say, well, look, let's cover that in September, October, yeah. whatever. You've got to do it today. Since the pandemic, we've seen the, the proportion of online retail sales in this country uh, go from 20% to about 35%. And your business is a little, little microcosm of that because your business has quadrupled because it's overwhelmingly an online business. Yeah, so absolutely. you've thrived during COVID. We have. We think that about five years, and I feel a bit of, and as a side of me, which is a bit embarrassed, the fact no, that, sure. you know, um, but the, we think there's about five years worth of growth has been condensed into about 12 to 18 months. Just that, that you know, if we were carrying on on our sort of 15 to 20 percent growth, yeah. um, but it's just all been been pushed into into a, a, a very narrow window, and people have got used to buying plants online, yeah. and they're going to carry on doing it because when this year when, in, in uh, 21 we we thought, well, we can't carry on growing at the rate we did last year. It's carried on. <laughs> we 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 actually had quite modest budgets for this year. We thought, well, that was a crazy year last year. Yeah. We can't have another crazy. But it's actually been remarkably strong, and um, and that's exciting. Tell us where 
the business will go. It's Chelsea Flower Show week. You've had some success there. What's the future of the business look like, Mark? Well, it's difficult to say. Um, it, it was set up uh, by um, a, a, a um, colleague of mine, Peter Clay, and myself. We set it up uh, together. We own the, the bulk of the business. But we're getting to a certain age where you're sort of thinking about what, what to do, looking at options. We will do, um, uh, we did, we'll do 30 million this year. We'll, I, I, I think That's your turnover. I, turnover, yeah. Uh, I have a target of 50. At some stage, will be interesting to uh, someone as a potential acquisition. Um, the great thing for, for me is that we are really quite strongly profitable and, and particularly strongly cash generative. And that means that we can do all sorts of quite interesting new developments. We've recently launched an app where we've invested quite heavily in, in the technology. Um, and if, if, if the core business is strong, then I think it really um, it gives you lots of interesting opportunities. Um, and you mentioned the Chelsea Flower Show. We just picked up our 30th gold medal this morning. Actually, I've just come from the, from the showground. Um, for some reason, they give out the medals. Uh, well, it's exciting. Yeah, it's really exciting. So, so the 30 is a big number for us. So, uh, What's really interesting to you, the cultivation of the plants or the distribution and packaging and the, the more mechanical side of the business? As the business has grown, I've been dragged more and more into the sort of the business and the logistics yeah. Yeah. Uh, side of it. Uh, and so my plant knowledge... Um, is getting less and less. It's quite frustrating because there's, there's always someone who knows more about plants than you do. It's one of the things about horticulture, and it's not helped by the fact it's basically all in Latin. Um, <laughs> so um, I now keep my mouth shut if someone says, what's that plant? Because I know someone else will know the answer. Um, but uh, we've got a great uh, a gr a group of um, horticulturists who, who are looking for the, the latest plants. So I'm, I'm getting dragged more and more away from that and more onto the sort of the business side of it. And alongside Crocus, you're involved in another business, more of grounds, maintenance, gardens, yeah. uh, nurture, um, and between them, it's quite a substantial operation, uh, operating on pretty good margins, employing lots of people. It does really uh, counter the view of horticulture as a, as a low margin, rather unfashionable, uh, unattractive sector. Uh, absolutely. I mean, th these are two businesses, both were startups. The combined sales of, of, of Crocus and Nurture now uh, this year will be about 120 million. We employ about 1,900 people. Wow. Uh, EBITDA of about 18 million. Earnings for interest, tax, dividends, and amortization. Correct. Absolutely. <laughs> well done. <laughs> that world all now deals in that number. But it's, <laughs> it's really exciting. And what it proves to me is that the, um, the horticulture is an industry where you can make good money. It can be a high margin. It's, it, um, people think it's some kind of sort of manual uh, industry. It's not. It's a very skilled industry. Mm. It's well paid now. And you can make, uh, you know, you can build a really successful business. I, I hope that we've sort of shown that that is possible. And what would you say to youngsters watching this Money Talks interview with you thinking, gosh, he's a really successful bloke. How do I become a successful businessman, businesswoman? Well, it's very simple because if I can do it, that per person watching your program can do it. Um, you just got to have belief. I mean, it takes time. One, uh, I would love to say that, that, that we launched Crocus about three years ago and it's suddenly 30 million. It takes a long, it's taken us best part of 20 years. Um, it doesn't always happen overnight. But if you really strongly believe and you have that perseverance, uh, uh, if, I can, uh, say, if I can do it, anyone else can do you it. You have to be quite single-minded, don't you? You have to be able to look people in the eye who you respect, who tell you you're mad. No, actually, I'm not mad. This is going to work and I'm going to show yeah. you. There must have been people in your life that thought, Mark, what are you doing? You know, you're a serious bloke. You're going to grow flowers for a living? When I left my uh, overpaid job in the city, a lot of people said, what on earth are you doing? Yeah. Um, and there were one or two people who, who, when we originally launched Crocus, we were raising money and they said, I'll be bust in a year and yeah. that kind of stuff. But Midlife crisis. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but um, I think my family will, will um, uh, back, back me up and say, I am pretty determined. People have this view that gardeners are nice, fluffy people. You know, when we get to the Chelsea Flower Show, for example, we like winning. You know, we're competitive. Um, and I think that's at the core of, you know, if you believe it you, enough um, and you get some good people around you, you can, I think you can achieve most things. Mark Fain, thank you for joining me on Money Talks. Not at all. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks a lot for listening to Money Talks with me, Liam Halligan, Economics and Business Editor of GB News. If you've enjoyed this episode, please do leave a rating or review on Apple Podcasts, YouTube or wherever you're listening. Please do subscribe to this podcast and also check out my daily television show, On The Money, 
at 1pm Monday to Friday on GB News or via the GB News app. GB News, Britain's news channel.